Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, featuring interviews that take us deeper into the people and happenings on the local scene. For more podcasts and a closer look at what's going on in the Valley, visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Hello, welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast. My name is Dave Eisenstadter. I'm the editor of The Advocate, and I'm here with arts editor Gina Beavers. And we are here today with Meg Bantle. She is a columnist who writes O Cannabis for us at The Advocate. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for, for having me. Out. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, what's going on in the world of cannabis? Sure. Well, I, I just wrote an article this week about how Vermont is the first state to pass uh, recreational cannabis through the legislature. So that's exciting because most other states have done it, all other states have done it through ballot initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is kind of a, a big move, especially because a lot of other states in the country are looking to do this same kind of legislation this year or later this year potentially. So uh, Vermont did it. It, uh, it doesn't legalize sale, but you can uh, possess you know, for personal use up to an ounce if you're an adult uh, 21 or older. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it's fascinating that it, it actually went through the legislature because it seems like every single, I mean, you were just said, every single other place that this has happened, it's been up to the voters to mm -hmm. kind of force it through moving around a, a legislature that didn't want to act on it themselves. So what do you think the difference in Vermont was? Well. They are a more progressive state, mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, they don't have a ballot initiative process, which is kind of different. You would right. think that they would as a progressive state. Um, and there is mixed support for it there. They have a Republican governor, as we do in Massachusetts, and he, you know, he said in his press release that he signed the, the bill with uh, mixed emotions so mm -hmm. it's not exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah right. it's not something that everyone <laughs> is excited about there and uh, I think the the politicians who I spoke to who did vote it through said there's a lot of cannabis in Vermont already the more we can regulate it the safer people will be and potentially the more benefits that the the state can get from the cannabis industry mm -hmm. whereas right now it's all under the table and you know the state has no chance of ever you know, potentially taxing it for revenue or things like that. Oh, because so. there is no sale. Right, there's no sale, right, and that's still no sale. Like, as of July 1st, you'll be able to uh, have possess up to an ounce and grow um, two, two to four plants, I believe. So in Vermont, you basically have to grow it and give it to people. You can't, like, that's the yeah. whole... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there will be no, uh, no recreational sale at this time, okay. at this okay. point, yeah. So how is yeah. that different in Massachusetts? So come July uh, in Massachusetts, they will be legalizing recreational sale if everything okay. goes to plan. So right now, uh, it's kind of like Vermont. It, we're, we're in this limbo right now where we can possess up to a certain amount legally for recreational purposes and grow up to a certain amount, um, but we can't sell it. And mm -hmm. so that is the state that Vermont is going to be in indefinitely until they decide to do something else. Whereas Massachusetts is working on more progressions so that come summer, people will be able to open businesses where they could sell recreational marijuana. Yeah, yeah. you wrote this great story a few weeks ago about uh, everyone's favorite attorney general, Jeff Sessions, <laughs> saying that actually all of these uh, procedures that we had in place under Obama are now rescinded and we are gonna start going after um, marijuana users in states where they've legalized it and mm -hmm. so it's kind of like is it legal or right. isn't it legal? Right. Yeah that really threw a wrench in things in mass where people were starting to get excited. Uh, he basically basically under Obama the an attorney general had come out and said you know it's still illegal but we're not going to be focusing on it. It's not something that we're going to be putting resources towards and so Sessions came out and basically took those guidelines away saying, you know, no, we are going to be focusing on it like, you know, and then uh, the Massachusetts, um, I forget his title, mm. Le his name's Andrew Lelling, yes, he's right. the attorney appointed under the Trump administration, mm. the federal attorney in Massachusetts, and he came out and he could have said, you know, 
Massachusetts resources aren't going to be going towards prosecuting cannabis based on state laws, but instead he kind of agreed with Sessions and said, Mm. "Act, you know, this is the law and we're going to be prosecuting people and there's always a risk because all, you know, illegal uh, possession and sales are illegal. And so a lot of people were less mad about Sessions and more mad about Lelling Mm. because you know, other other uh, appointed state officials in states like, I believe it was the two people in Oregon and Colorado, mm-hmm. kind of, you know, came out against Sessions and said, we're going to be leaning on state, the state guidelines. Um, but Lelling kind of put his foot down and said, you know, no, it's illegal. And, you know, you can't, we could, you don't know if we're going to come after you. And then, but then just this week, he came out and not a press release but this is the email I sent you Mm. he held a press conference where he said that he was more concerned about the opioid epidemic and that cannabis doesn't pose as big of a threat as opioids so I don't I don't know I haven't quite talked to people since that happened just this week but I I think that kind of signals that right you know he's not actually that concerned about cannabis right uh, in the state, so hopefully people can start to relax a little bit more. And um, and the reason all this matters is that with you know without uh, if people are worried that the federal government is going to come after them, it's it's less about the personal user and more about you know banks who are funding mm, right. businesses who want to open. And right. um, as we kind of mentioned earlier, uh, the the note that came out from Sessions caused banks to stop their, you know, stop moving forward in investing in businesses and uh, caused even medical marijuana facilities to start uh, only using cash interactions. Right. So that's a lot of cash moving in and out of those places and, you know, forces the customer to bring cash, Mm -hmm. which is a security risk. So it all really was a big mess. You know, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's just what Sessions wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So I, I mean, we talked a lot about kind of like the politics of weed, but you've ri- you've written a bunch of stuff like about, uh, you know, topical marijuana versus ingesting marijuana mm-hmm. and just other kind of uh, aspects of it. I'm just kind of curious if you can talk a little bit about like, you know, just the the physical plant and you know just like just things about sure. marijuana too. <laughs> Um, well, where to start? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll start with some of the terms I've learned oh, through yeah. my a couple of articles. So, uh, THC is, uh, I can't, I actually don't know the full word for it, but THC is what they call a cannabinoid. And there are, that is the cannabinoid in, can, in the cannabis plant that make, has psychotropic effects. So that's what makes you feel high. But there are... Uh, at least 80 different kinds of cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, including mm. CBD, which is the mm. other uh, better known one that you could, you'll see legal now if you go into a head shop or a tobacco shop, they'll have CBD products. And that doesn't cause a psych- psychotropic effect, but you know is said to help with uh, an- you know being anti-inflammatory mm. and um, all kinds of you know medicinal effects so people still take it I, I interviewed someone who said that they put it on a tumor that their dog had and mm. the tumor just shrunk by itself you know after putting the CBD on it so mm. you know people really have have evidence that you know even that cannabino- can- cannabinoid works um, and that has no psychotropic effects so that you know even if you ingest it can't cause a high so that was also the coffee I drank when I interviewed Mm. I interviewed a woman who wants to open a cannabis cafe in East Hampton Mm. and she couldn't give me a THC product at the moment but she could give me a coffee that was uh, made with coffee beans that were roasted with CBD so I didn't really feel high maybe felt a little more relaxed Mm -hmm. than usual. Coffee that makes you relax. Yeah so so when when medical marijuana companies are putting out products like a topical cream what they're doing is kind of engineering all of these different cannabinoids Mm. in a certain way that is particularly effective for the result they want so um, yeah, so that's really interesting to hear, you know, the, the scientists who are doing that, they're really thinking it's not just, you know, 
like you think of putting the plant in a pot with some butter and then you know that's the only way to do it they're really kind of isolating the different aspects of the plant and creating specific medicinal effects as we're kind of getting more and more into pot being legal territory mm-hmm. it seems like like a lot of people are afraid of getting high but it's like they still want the the medicinal effects and yep. it's kind of like there are products geared to those people like you don't have to get high from using cannabis right. which is kind of it's just kind of interesting mm-hmm. that there's that whole market that maybe people didn't even think about being there. Yeah. I think the other thing is that a lot of people don't want to smoke. And mm. in in the Massachusetts yeah. right. law, uh, they're, if they legalize something like a cannabis cafe, kind of Amsterdam style right. cannabis cafe, they won't, it won't include smoking because of air pollution mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, air quality control issues. So that's, I mean, preferable for a lot of people sure. also. And something I'm researching right now is this, uh, the process, and I'm going to make sure I get this right, uh, decarboxylation, oh. um, which is a very <laughs> a long, <laughs> yeah, a very long word for uh, burning, like wh- why you smoke marijuana, right. basically. It's just cooking it. So uh, all basically, if you didn't cook the marijuana before ingesting it you you would have to have a lot of it to get high and it's this whole kind of scientific process of separating the THC you know transforming the THC from its original form to a different form that that that's then accessible to your uh to your body Mm -hmm. um so I had this really interesting interview with a woman in uh, Boston who owns a business called Ardent and she created a, a decarboxylator, which is this little machine. It's, it kind of works like a little oven, mm-hmm. um, and, but it's more regulated. So all you have to do is press a button and it, it will cook your- Easy bake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> easy bake oven. Yeah, it's, it's like, like, it you. is, it is. It's like easy bake med- medicinal marijuana because oh, <laughs> you just press a button and then it is perfectly decarboxylated so it becomes a lot easier to work with medicinally because you it's more predictable in terms of dosage you know you get a hundred percent conversion from one state to another whereas you know when you're burning you're turning a lot into ash Mm -hmm. and you know there's it's really hard to tell you have you really have no way to tell oh I I converted all of the THC into a usable form like Mm. more likely you converted like 50% of it and burned the rest away so I think that would be fascinating if if like some time in the future a few years in the future that nobody smokes marijuana anymore that's just like that's like an old-fashioned thing everyone just has a little decarbon decarbon it's it's really cool she's she's an amazing business owner and um and the her name's chanel Lindsay. just to make sure i get her name out there but the it's it's a really interesting machine and i'm excited to talk to people about their current decarboxylating processes you know for people who maybe are making uh, candies or edibles mm-hmm. at home you know how how do they go about doing that because people will do it in their oven or in a in a water bath um, but as she said you know she tried that for several years and uh, eventually found out that she was getting really poor results compared to you know um, so she invented you know worked with designers to invent this machine that gives you almost a hundred percent and that yeah it's just really if you're someone who has trouble, you know, affording medical products from a medical dispensary. Right. Yeah. This could be a way to, you know, dose yourself um, because you can e- just predict more regularly just the weed that you're getting from a friend or that you're growing yourself, how that converts down the line to, you know, the candy, the brownie, the tincture. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, you know, just doing that kind of off the cuff in butter in a pan it's really hard to know how high you're going to get or right. how what you know what the effects are going to be with and you can do trial and error but this way you can it's a little more predictable that's great that there's kind of this structure to kind of be a little bit more di di- like do it yourself right. yeah. diy uh with marijuana mm-hmm. that's now becoming more and more legal mm-hmm. yeah. ish being able to control your own medicine in right a way. Yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. um it's all, you also written about a few of like the the dangers that people are at least worried about with marijuana, like um, like driving under the influence mm-hmm. and how that's kind of a um, 
I don't know, like people don't really know how to get around that. Right. Yeah, that's that was something that a lot of people brought up that I interviewed in Vermont this week who, you know, the chief of police in Brattleboro said it's really concerning to me that the the process of testing someone on the side of the road for uh, THC is not perfected. Right. Um, and, you know, basically there there is no way to... Well, b- basically what the science shows is that THC in the blood, the level of THC in the blood is not correlated to highness or impairment levels. So even though they can, you know, do a blood test back when they get back to the station right. and test for THC levels, that doesn't necessarily correlate to your level of imp- impairness. Um, Part, partly because um, the, more y- the more you smoke it, like the higher that your THC level could be or that your baseline is in, that yeah in part and also that you could be feeling um THC is fat soluble mm-hmm. so mm. it is absorbed from the bud- bloodstream faster than alcohol so it's al- also the opposite is true which is that you could be feeling very high and very be very you know be impaired but your THC levels won't be mm-hmm. that high mm. so it's hard to come up with a baseline um and, you know, that's concerning, concerning for law enforcement art, uh, officers who, you know, at this point, they have this standardized uh, test that they do for any kind of impairment on the side of the road. Um, but then they, they're also kind of training more people to be what they call drug recognition officers who can uh, use more medical tests to determine, like, okay, this person is on you know this drug because of pupil dilation or like blood pressure blood pressure levels etc so um, those are basically the only tools that they have at this point point. Um, and even though some states have decided on a THC level as a as a limit like they've decided on a 0.08 alcohol level for THC but mm. a lot of people don't agree with that standard because of the reasons we already discussed it's not really an accurate measure of impairment so that's something that I'm sure a lot of people are working on I would think that there are mm. some scientists working on that <laughs> well you talked to one guy yeah. who's like who made an app about it yeah so that he um I, I talked to someone who designed an app called Druid uh, that tests for Im- impairment um, by it works best if you establish a baseline on the app yourself right. it's you know tests like reaction time and accuracy and balance and you just kind of play this five minute game on your phone and ideally you do that when you're sober and then if you wanted to test yourself after a drink or two or after smoking you could play the game and it would compare that level to your baseline level. So it's not establishing a universal baseline necessarily, but comparing you to yourself. And um, it's not likely to be something that's used by police, but it could be useful for testing yourself um, but and also potentially for employers you know pe- he's gotten phone calls from people who work for steel unions who want to use it for people who are um, operating heavy equipment not right. not even necessarily because they're worried about alcohol or drug impairment but because they're worried about tiredness you know people who work in traffic mm-hmm. or transportation um, he talked about the recent Navy crashes and how those yeah. right, those accidents Deadly happened crashes. because of impairment due to tiredness and over and exhaustion. So this is an app that you could say, you know, employers could say like every time you get behind the wheel of X vehicle or X machinery, you have to take the test and prove that you're meeting your baseline. Mm-hmm. Mm. Gina and I were talking about that story on the radio the other day, mm-hmm. and the. Yeah. Um, uh, with with Trumpy on Trumpy. hits hits ninety four three, and he he thought that people would use this for what, what, what did he say? He was like, like, I could get higher than you. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> like, like why I'm gonna be way above my baseline? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it is a fun game too, like to just do every day. Like yeah. I do it when I'm waiting in line or something. Oh and wow! Really? Yeah, I've got it on my phone now. It's it's a dollar to get on Apple and Android phones and and i haven't done it uh impaired yet yeah. you know and i, I what think are the games like it's uh they're hard that's one thing you shouldn't oh. judge yourself based on the first time because you kind of get <laughs> used to it and then you do it again but you have to you know they'll be it'll say like if you see an, a square 
click the square. If you see a circle, click the oval at the top oh, of the screen. So then you're like hard. square, 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 and then oval. And then the next round is the opposite. So if you see a square, click the oval. If you see a circle, click the circle. Interesting. And then there's a balance one where you hold it in your hand. And there's one more that is escaping me. So your phone knows how well balanced you are? Is yeah. That, mm-hmm. That's kind of scary it in and of itself. It tracks how, <laughs> how far you move. I don't know. Oh, if it, oh that's yeah. okay. sure. Yeah. It must be kind of like how remote controls work, like, mm-hmm. you know, if you're shaking it in your hand. Mm. But, yeah, I think it's, you know, someone said to me, it seems like the, if you have to ask yourself if you're impaired and do the game, you probably shouldn't mm. drive. <laughs> so, I, and I think that's Very true, but point. I think the game has a lot of, you know, potential applications across the board for, for employers and uh, even for people who want a defense against being accused of being impaired, right. potentially, you know, they could show, like, I did this app at this time, and I don't, you know, yeah, none we'll of it. Yeah, see what, like, the judge is yeah, I know, like, I'm kind of like, playing like a, a game? Know, yeah, well, I guess I mean more for, like, empl- you know, if your yeah. employer oh, sure. is saying, yep. like, yep. Are you okay? Or um, yeah, so I think it, he he was excited because it seems like there's a lot of potential applications right. for it. So yeah. do you have a baseline? Do you know like what's your? Do you have like a score? Uh, what's your? There like, was a. I don't remember. Okay. Um, yeah. But he did. They they do have a suggested um, impairment score that if you get above this level, you're probably impaired, mm. even no matter what your regular baseline is. But I'm, the ac- exact numbers are escaping me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, it sounds interesting. It does. Yeah, I you just should would download. Hope that it. My baseline would not look like I was a <laughs> right. Yeah, he said. <laughs> right. he said you're just a moron. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> it's very tricky. I mean, don't yeah. don't let it. The first time is hard. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw that first score out. Like oh, yeah. that's not yeah. me. That's not me. Yeah. You can do a practice round. I think so. Do the practice <laughs> round. Yeah, but you want it. To, I mean, you kind of want it to be hard. I like yeah. that. I like that. If you see a circle, click the oval. <laughs> like like, what? It's like mm. yeah. Yeah. For people who are non-readers like me, click the circle. Oops. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Throw that one out. Yeah, and you're and it goes faster than p- really you can. Oh, that's the other one is that you're tracing the square. You just have to follow it around while at the same time counting the number of you know circles that pop up in the background. Oh. So you have to try and keep your on the square as much as possible, and then and then it's like you know one, two, three, four, five, six, and, yeah. and then at the end they ask you how many circles there were. Yeah. Wow, that so sounds I have to download that. so hard. <laughs> I know it does, doesn't it? I might have to do that yep. just, just to see my own prowess. Yeah. Um, I guess one other thing I'm curious about is, I mean, this is such a fast-moving area, mm-hmm. cannabis. Do you have any uh, cannabis predictions of mm. what's going to happen in 2018? Like, I don't know, or, or, or in the near future. Yeah, I mean, after seeing Vermont and doing a bit of reading in about other states, I think we'll see quite a few resolutions on the 2018 ballot and other mm. like ballot resolutions there i believe michigan has one going through you know with enough signatures they're just waiting for approval and then i want to say the new jersey the governor maybe just you know he went into the process saying on a platform for marijuana legalization so mm. there's probably at least four that have solid leads on uh, legalization already. So I'm definitely expecting a few more states to legalize come election season. And um, and then hopefully come this summer in Massachusetts, we'll see licenses start to right. get handed out. And I think that even with the snags on the federal level, there's a, um, enough support from, you know, our Republican governor, our uh, uh, Attorney General Mara Healy both came out against Jeff Sessions mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. Mm. So I think that almost everyone on the state level, even Lelling, are realizing that this is what the voters want and we can't put it off anymore. And, you know, it's um, hopefully, you know, hopefully the, the banks feel like there's an, enough of a safety net that they can start to, to support future business ventures. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, great to have you in, Meg. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for stopping by. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. And don't forget to visit us at valleyadvocate.com.